I am sure that one of the first things that come to your mind when you hear the word spider is the webs that they make. But of all the documented species of spiders, which number over 40,000, all of them produce silk, but not all construct webs. Now, I'm sure that most of you, when you think of spider webs, you see this image. And this is the image that pops into your mind when you see storybooks or at Halloween time. And this is called an orb web. These webs are roughly circular and filled with a series of concentric circles that get progressively smaller towards the middle of the web. And the web itself is divided into sectors by separate silk threads. Since this is the type of web that we're most familiar with, I think that it's the best example to show the different parts of a web. So the, some of the main parts are the hub, which is the center of the web, which is where the spider usually sits. Um, you have the frame threads, which border the web. Then you have the sticky spiral, or the insect catching area. And then you have the anchor points, which are the points of attachment um, to the web, um, of the web to the substrate. Next, I'm sure you must be wondering, how do these tiny creatures construct these intricate um, designs of silk? And I'll show you. First of all, the spider climbs to a height, maybe on a branch or on a rock, and it releases a line of silk, which catches on the wind. If this silken thread makes contact with a substrate, um, the spider will pull it tightly to make sure that it's securely fastened. Next, it will walk across this line of silk to the other point while releasing another line of silk, which it attaches to the other point. It will then walk back to the center and then drop down, forming a Y shape. Next, the spider fills in the gaps, making the frame thread, and then fills in the center with the sector threads and then the radar. And that is how the web is constructed. Now, although we might be familiar with the orb web, Spiders make various types of webs. Um, one of these types is the bowl and dolly type. And as you can see, it resembles um, a bowl, obviously, on, on a crochet doily. And I'm sure many of you have seen this maybe at your grandparents' house. Now basically the bowl design is to catch any insects which will fall down from the vegetation. Uh, the next type of web is the sheet web and this does the same thing. It intercepts prey that falls from the surrounding vegetation as well as intercepting flying prey. Um, the cob web it's basically a sticky mass of silk and it does the same thing as the sheet web. Now the funnel web, this is often built by tarantulas and some build it as retreats where they can rest and consume the prey that they've caught while others use it to camouflage their bodies. For example, purse web spiders which actually bite their prey through the silk of the funnels. But why do spiders build webs? Well, as we've seen, the primary function is to capture prey. However, there is a secondary function. Now, as I mentioned, uh, not all spiders build webs. Those that do not build webs 
they uh, they actually hunt their prey by stalking and ambushing them so therefore they have excellent eyesight however web building spiders since they depend on the web so much they are almost blind so they actually depend on their webs as a communication device and from the vibrations of the web they can tell if um, the size of the prey um, sometimes the type of the prey if it's if it's their favorite type or if if it's not their favorite they will just cut it down or if it's too big for them to handle they might just cut it loose rather than it demolishing the entire web um, it can also give them information on for mating for example male spiders um, when they now males and female spiders occupy separate webs until it's time to mate um, so during the mating period for that species the male will go on the on a web of a female and he will actually taste her silk and this is to determine if she is of the correct species and of the correct age uh, sometimes if she is of the correct age some of the courtship rituals involve him plucking the plucking the silk of the web and the the way that he plucks it um, will send the correct signals to her if he plucks it the wrong way he will end up as a meal however spiders some spiders actually um, include various designs in their web and one of these is called the stabilimentum now the stabilimentum is basically thick bands of silk uh, usually placed in a, in a zigzag pattern and arranged in different orientations um, for instance it's if it's in a discoid pattern that's usually found in the webs of juveniles and or it can be placed in um, straight lines which is commonly called a ribbon stabilimentum and uh, as you can see from the pictures in this slide um, and this is a common species found in Trinidad is Argyp argentata another species that um, that builds stabilimentum found in Trinidad is called um, Gastrocantha cancriformis or crab spider and you can see that by the shape of its abdomen now it arranges it a bit differently it arranges it in tufts along some of its silken threads so that it actually looks like dashed lines and Trinidad has yet another stabilimentum building um, spider and this is of the genus Cyclosa however it builds its stabilimentum in a different way it makes first makes the silk stabilimentum a ribbon stabilimentum in this case and it covers it in detritus such as dry leaves faces or old exoskeletons and then it places itself roughly in the middle in the hub um, it's brown in color so it, it blends in with the detritus so you can see in this case the detritus stabilimentum provides it with camouflage but is that the only reason why they build a stabilimentum I mean why why should this tiny creature invest so much time and resources in in producing so much silk to make this elaborate design well the functions of the stabilimentum remain controversial right but there are two main hypotheses to why spiders include them in their webs and both of them actually deal with the fact that it's very reflective the first is that it provides defense against visually hunting predators by masking the spider's position and how this works is that the silk is highly reflective so if you think that like for instance Argyp argentata this big X in the web is actually like the X on a treasure map marking the spot of the spider it's not that way 
it's it's so reflective that the predator actually sees a big bright spot so it's seeing a spot but it's not seeing the spider and the second hypothesis is that it actually attracts prey now the same way that it, it looks like a big white uh, big clear spot the to the insect it actually looks like a gap in the vegetation so that the the insects will actually fly into this gap but end up in the spider's web also some plants have nectar guides on their petals uh, which are just patterns of reflected UV light so they might be seeing these patterns as as these nectar guides leading them to a food source and be attracted to them and in turn get entangled in the web. Now some some types of spiders some species they use their webs in different ways. For example, the Dianopidae or net casting spiders they actually make a small orb web and and hold it between their first two pairs of legs and they're, they're kind of a cross between an orb weaving spider and a, a hunting spider or a wandering spider they would actually wait in the vegetation and when they see a suitable prey they would actually throw the net over them like how a fisherman would cast a seine Another type is the uh, species of the family Theridiosomatidae or ray spiders. And what they do is that after they construct their orb web, they would take up position at the hub and they would pull the web back to form a cone and wait. So when they too see a suitable prey that comes close to them, they would release the web which flies towards the insect like a spring catching it and both of these uh, families are again found in Trinidad and what they do instead of waiting for insects to either fall or fly into their webs they actually send their webs to the prey but spiders cannot solely depend on their webs to catch prey I mean a web will definitely slow the prey down but the spider still has to be quick to get to it before it escapes uh, the spider's bite is also integral in getting the prey since it it contains um, chemicals such as digestive enzymes so say for instance uh, two insects were caught in rapid succession in its web rather than attending to one and then the other leaving it unattended and it might escape it will bite one and then go and bite the other one leave that and then go back and wrap up the the first one in silk and it can it can leave the second one with with confidence because it's actually being digested from the inside out so it's less likely that it will escape now the besides speed and its bite the and its web some uh, some web building spiders do not depend again solely on their webs some of them would actually try to attract prey on their own and some do this by having bright body colors and what this does is it it's similar to a stibilamenta in that it also reflects uv light Now we've seen how webs enable the spiders to get food, but what about defense? And to understand that you have to, to look at the types of predators that a spider is trying to escape from. The first of all, the first predator is birds, uh, the second uh, is lizards which actually play a major role in structuring web building spider communities in the West Indies. Another type of predator are mud dauber wasps 
and they would actually catch spiders and use them to um, provision their cells which have developing larva in them. And another predator are actually other spiders. Now kleptoparasitic spiders um, and the picture in the slide is an example of one found in Trinidad. This is um, Argyrodes elevatus. Now in normal numbers they are actually found in webs of larger species of spiders and they, they, they feed off little bits of food that the whole spider has left behind. However, in, in large enough numbers, they can actually overpower and kill the whole spider. And of course, the final predator the spider faces are humans. Now, to avoid predation, web building spiders actually employ a variety of defense mechanisms involving their webs. And the examples that I have chosen here, they are, you would most likely see them on any walk into a rainforest. They are found usually between the, um, the spaces between buttressed roots, which I call buttress notches. And the first one is Azelia vaccioni. And what this does is that it actually holds onto its web and shake it quite violently. Whereas the, the second one, which is the, the red-bodied spider, that is Mesa boliva or Antiacus, and that is of the family Fulcidae. Now what it does it is it usually it will hold on to the underside of the web and move its body in a circular motion until it appears like a blur to the human eye. Right. Now spiders of this family, their predators are usually visual and include other spiders, such as jumping spiders. So by swinging its body in the circular motion, what it's doing is that it, it's actually distorting the outline of its body and making it difficult for the predator to focus and capture them. But it also makes the spider appear much larger than it really is. So it's acting like an intimidation tactic against the predator. <coughs> now, besides shaking the web, some spiders, they would actually modify their webs as a form of defense. And uh, this, this includes um, building tangles of silk on either the front or the back of the web or both. And uh, this serves multiple functions. Besides giving structural support to the web, it actually acts as an early warning system against approaching predators, for example, wasps. And this is included um, by the spider species that you see here, um, Lucage. <coughs> but what about large webs? I'm sure you must be asking, how do those come about and why do the spiders build them in the first place? Okay. Now, the reason for this in one of these instances is that typically large species of spiders will build large webs. And when I say large, I mean um, spanning a meter or more in diameter. And this is because, I mean, large spiders would eat large prey items. So they need a large web in order to subdue them. Now, one of the examples is Eryphora atrax, and that's the black spider you see on the slide. This is found in Trinidad. It is actually a nocturnal species, and it feeds on small bats. However, this is not a hard and fast rule 
that only big spiders make big webs. Um, for example, in many of the smaller islands in the Eastern Caribbean, for example, Nevis, um, there, there are webs of a uh, similar diameter, a meter, and they are made by very small species where the length, body length of the individual measures um, less than a centimeter. For in example, in this case of the genus Lucagi. And this is because they are actually the largest spider species present. So they occupy that niche since they have no competition. Right. So besides individual spiders making huge webs, groups of spiders can actually make huge webs. And of the almost 40,000 species of spiders that have been documented, approximately 20 species show varying degrees of sociality. Um, you can see the web in the picture. That is actually made by... Um, now, I'm sure on hikes some of you have seen this and were told that they are tarantula webs. However, this one is actually made by a social species of spider called Anellocymus eximus, again found in Trinidad and Tobago. And in the drawing on that same slide, that is made by another colonial species, Philippinella republicana. And as you can see, it's actually a collection of individual orb webs. Now, why do these spiders make these webs? Well, actually, it's um, pretty much the same concept. They are very small spiders, so if they get together and make more webbing, they can catch more prey or larger prey. Now, although these do look like permanent structures, I must note um, that they are not. They would um, exhibit this behavior when the um, conditions are suitable. For instance, if they are at an area where there's where prey is plentiful, they would construct these huge webs. Now, as I said, many spiders are solitary, right? They, they do not tolerate other spider species around them. However, large webs can be made by the efforts of multiple species. Um, this photo is actually from a news report um, some years ago. It was taken during a flood in Pakistan, I believe in 2009. And when these webs were examined, they were actually composed of different spider species. And, and of different um, spider families. Now the reason that they came together to make these gigantic webs was of course to escape the flood and the only dry spots were these trees. So times were hard so they got together, made these huge webs and were able to catch prey and survive. But one of the common questions that I'm asked is what good are spiders to humans? And the same goes for their webs. How could spider webs benefit humans? Well, first of all, spiders produce silk. And silk is used in the textile industry. So it, it does have an influence in the fashion industry. Of course, I must note it's not very viable because it's, it's very, it's very time-consuming. To, to collect um, and produce and induce these spiders to make webs. However, the the spy, uh, however, on a whole, spider silk is one of the strongest um, materials um, found both naturally as well as um, if compared to synthetic fibers. And it is actually eight times more elastic than Kevlar. And Kevlar is the material used to produce bulletproof vests. So imagine adapting the elasticity of 
of spider webs into protective gear such as this. Now if you're wondering why there is an artist in this slide, um, webs were actually used in art where um, they were also used in art in the form of cobweb painting. And in this form of art, the artist would actually use the webbing as the canvas and paint on the webbing. Um, spider webs were actually also used in medicine and were utilized as bandages in Europe where they helped reduce the bleeding and helped in the healing process. And they were able to do this because they were rich in vitamin K, which helps in blood clotting. Um, spider webs were also used to get food. And in the South Pacific, tribes would actually use spider webs to fish. And how they would do this is that they would make a wooden frame and induce the spider to build a web in the frame. Right? And then they would use this as a fishing net. Now, as I mentioned previously, spider silk is very strong, but it's also quite water resistant. And we can all see that because you've seen how raindrops hang from a spider web. So it using this is quite ideal and it provides the ideal natural fishing net. Now the last application to humans um, from spider webs is in the area of engineering. Now I'm sure that you've seen very flimsy webs and have wondered why did the spider even bother to make it. Well if you really look at it, although it's flimsy, it's able to withstand gentle winds and strong winds. But the spider silk has so much more to offer because on a molecular level, they build their webs so strong that they can actually resist hurricane force winds. And also, if you notice, if a part of a spider web is, is damaged, the the rest of the web is not it does not fall apart or collapse so the, sp the spider does not have to go and build an entirely new web it can just you know it can ju it just repairs a little part of it or it can leave it unrepaired and the web just continues to function um, catching prey and it's providing um, the spider with information as a communication tool. So the spider uses less energy and material in, in, in repairing and building these webs. So imagine utilizing this technology in, in our buildings and being able to produce materials that can resist um, strong winds from a hurricane, especially as we live in the Caribbean. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.